Hey, Good Shepherd, welcome to Church Online. I know it's weird not coming in and seeing each other's faces and giving hugs. I really miss that so much. But isn't it so nice being snuggled up on the couch with the people you love, hopefully in your sweatpants and with your favorite beverage? That's not terrible, just gotta say. But we would still like to see your face. If you could grab your phone, take a quick picture of yourself, and post it down below in the comments. It's just fun. It's just fun to see what other people are doing. We miss seeing you. <laughs> if you are new to Good Shepherd, we still wanna to get to know you. If you could post your name below in the comments, we would love to connect with you and get to know you and welcome you into the Good Shepherd family. Now, church family on a celebratory note, giving during this time has been about 70 to 75% of the norm. That's amazing. It really just goes to show that God is providing for this place during this time. And on another note, we will be streaming both a Good Friday service and the Easter services this weekend. And so we encourage you to invite your friends and family to watch this with you through watch parties online. We are so excited to celebrate with you the resurrection of Jesus when he overthrew the clutches of sin and death forever. <laughs> right now, we're going to worship this Jesus together our Lord God Almighty, our way maker. Let's worship. Well, welcome Good Shepherd Community Church. So glad to be here with you. Let me just pray, Lord, we love you. And we wanna come before you and worship. We say that your name is holy and you are good. So despite circumstances and fears and emotions, we come before you and we lift up our hearts right now to worship you. Let's sing, we stand and lift up our hands. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great Come on, sing it out. 
Hey, church, it's a little bit different for us right now, isn't it? It's kind of strange for me to be here, even though we just enjoyed an amazing time of worship in Jesus. But still, I'm in the auditorium all by myself. There is nobody here. And I'm wondering if you might have known that. No, just kidding. Obviously, this is our situation, isn't it? We're now having to do church by uh, our team being able to bring it to you as we are right now. But we still want to be able to open God's word, even though it's different. And we're going to do it together because, as you know, the title of the series is called While We Wait. And we're going to get into that a little bit. But I want you to see the big idea of what I would like to talk about during this time. The big idea is this. While we wait together, stay together, rejoice, pray, have peace because the Lord is at hand. Uh, I don't know if some of you remember, but Bo Sue and I actually bought a dog. We named him Bo. He's a golden doodle and he's about four months old now and he weighs over 40 pounds. That means this little puppy is a big puppy. He has a big head, big body, big appetite. Everything about him is big. And I can't believe the amount of control already this dog is showing us because my wife is training the dog. She actually puts food in front of the dog, puts it over to the side, puts it over to this side, has the dog sit there and wait. And then when she says, go get it, the dog is obedient. And when the dog takes off and goes and gets the food, there's unbelievable delight. Well, this series is called While We Wait. And even though Bo has to sit there and wait, it's like there's something to anticipate, isn't there? I know that we anticipate kind of getting back to work and being at church again. That is what I'm waiting for. But scripture says in 1 Peter 5 that for you and I who are believers, there's something that is even more. Even though this is uncomfortable and different, he tells us that in due time, he will lift us up. Wait, church. Wait, people. And we know that in the early church, they understood what it was to wait. And today, the world not just in our community or in our nation, but we're noticing that this epidemic is hitting all humans in one way or another. And so today we even know that the death count around the world is 58,000. How awful and much for the church to be praying about. And in the United States alone, 6,700 people have passed in, in this state, in Oregon today, 21. And this is what the world is doing, is the world is waiting, aren't they? The whole world is waiting for the same thing. The entire world is waiting for the virus to end. And I just want to say I'm super proud of some of the people who are putting their lives at risk. And these people, some of you know, and my own son-in-law is a first responder, and he too is putting his life at risk and family. Uh, and I'm proud of him. But it does bring concern. Uh, the Norquist family uh, ransom 
a, a, a paramedic and others that I know that go to this church who are police officers and grocery store clerks, whoever you are, we need to continue to pray for them. But the message I want to share today is a message that calls us to wait on the Lord. And I know that waiting is hard. But it is from the Bible, and I would like you to open up your Bibles, if you would, to Philippians 4. Open up your iPhones. We have the version for you, and you can follow along. But I want us to understand a little bit of the history of the context that's going on in this passage, and that here is Paul. He's in a Roman jail. He actually himself is around the clock being chained with other with the uh, Roman guards, and he too is in a quarantine, isn't he, in this passage? And for Paul, he cannot wait to get out of this situation. And he was concerned about this little church in Philippi. Now, it's only been about 10 years since he had seen him, but this church was facing some challenges. And that does happen. Uh, people were being disowned by their family. The government was pressing in on them. And so there were challenges that were happening to this tiny little church. And Paul's desire is that they would wait in the Lord. And here's why. Because he's near. And Paul believes that the first step in waiting on the Lord is church. It is our togetherness. And even though we do not meet, even though I don't see you and you do not see me, we are still church and we have to do togetherness, don't we? The first part I want to notice in this outline is stay together because the Lord is at hand. Stay together because the Lord is at hand. We're going to work through verses 1 through 3. And this is very important to the Apostle Paul. Look at verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy, crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Notice this. Why does Paul want the church to wait on the Lord? But he wants them to do it together. And this is the call for us. Here's why he wants us to do it together is because you and I are related. When we receive Jesus, we are in union with him. The father is responsible to actually bring us into a union with Christ. And so because of this, Paul then notice in this text, not only says that you're related as brothers and sisters, but he says, you are my crown. Look at the passage. Isn't that interesting? Crown. I remember when the student ministry many years ago had a reunion and many of us were here, several hundred of them. And there was this one dear girl when she was in our high school ministry, she had lymph node cancer. And I remember it was one of my first times as a pastor praying over her and asking God for, to do some healing. And we anointed her with oil. And I'd never, ever done that before. And I can remember praying. And, and actually, I hadn't seen her for probably 20 plus years. And I noticed that I turned around and there was a somewhat familiar face because I hadn't seen her for some time. And she says, hi, Steve, it's Sheree. I want you to know something. I stand in firm in Jesus and I'm walking with Jesus. And you know what she was to me? She was my crown. And here's what the Apostle Paul is saying, is that when you are influencing or whether you've led somebody to Jesus or you're discipling them or you've ministered to them, they can actually be your crown now and they can be your crown for all of eternity. That's what Paul is saying. But then look at verse two. It says, I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind. And so what is the issue here? Is that there's a pleading going on from Paul because there's can, togetherness is actually being challenged. That even during this time of waiting, he says, I'm wanting you to be of the same mind. And the issue is not doctrinal, it's relational. And so what does Paul do in verse three? He says this, and I will ask you, my true companion, he's speaking of an individual, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written, notice, in the book of life. So what did Paul do? He sends companions to these dear ladies and he tells them unity is necessary in this time. It is primary, isn't it? And since you both are companions with me and you've been on the front lines with me, it's most important that you be confronted, that we stay together, church. And he lets them know that, but he's believing in them. 
You see, he's not just confronting them, not believing them. He calls them co-workers. He believes in them. But you see, this is the challenge and the challenge for us and the necessity for this text in speaking to us, Good Shepherd Church, is that we too have a challenge. And the challenge is we have to wait on the Lord. And I love this in the verse, verse one, he says, stand firm. See, our togetherness is like Philippi, isn't it? It's most important. I want us to think about this. This is really the longest time in Good Shepherd's history that we've not gathered. And we know that this is a different kind of gathering, isn't it? Uh, we have to figure out ways through social media to bring church to you. I'm Zooming for the first time when I'm chatting with individuals. And whenever I Zoom with them, I hit the wrong button and I lose everybody. But that's okay. We're learning, aren't we? And we're having church in the living room. And Sue and I, when we do church, it's my wife and I and a dog now. We're not with you and we miss you. But we need to hold on to each other and we need to call each other and serve each other, don't we? And we need to pray and we need to keep our attitudes Christ-centered, don't we? And the second point I want to mention to us, church, not only do we need to stay together, but we need to rejoice together because rejoice because the Lord is at hand. Look at the Bible when he speaks to us. I love this text. But I want us to notice verse 5. Notice verse 5. He says, the Lord is near. Now, why does Paul say the Lord is near? Think about that. First, church, there's an anticipation to the second coming of Christ. The Lord is near. I look at this passage in the same book in Philippians 3, 20. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, this Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul not only gets this anticipation, not of himself, but he gets it from Jesus, who actually told the disciples in Matthew 24, therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. For the early church, this phrase, the Lord is near, is what helped them to stand firm and strong and together and anticipation. But there was not only that anticipation, there was also this desire to stay near if in fact death was near. And Paul speaks to that, doesn't he? He lets us know a little bit later, doesn't he, in his life in 2 Timothy 4, 7, when he says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And so another way of looking the Lord is near is when death is near. One of our dear brothers, Ralph Alexander, last week, who we can't even have a service for right now, went home to be with Jesus, their family next to him, professor at Western Seminary, training pastors in Russia, he and his wife, Myrna. The Lord was near, and now he's near, near. Isn't that beautiful? And some of you do remember what it's like to be with people in their last hours, don't you? And we knew the Lord is near. But then I think even a clearer reason is this, when Paul says the Lord is near, is because I think he's talking about the presence of God. In Psalm 119, he says, 151, he says, you are near, Lord. This is not just a New Testament example of expression of recognizing God is near. It is throughout the pages of the Bible. Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Paul is saying God is near. The Old Testament is saying God is near. And God is revealing that he is omnipresent, fully there and fully personal with us. Which is why in Matthew 28, he says, And surely I am with you always, Jesus says, even to the end of the age. People, Jesus is present right now with us, which means with believers, he is present to bless you, to talk with you, to engage with you. And yet with people who do not know Christ, he can actually be in their presence and show during this time that he is near call on me. And that's what we need to be praying for people at this point, because we can actually be praying for people to come to know this Jesus. He is present, but he's now calling them to a repentance. So the question is, is God near in his coming? And I want to say, yeah, 
It's been over 2,000 years and the church has been anticipating his coming and we still need to do that. And is God near when people pass and we hear these numbers and we know that some of them have died and they were Jesus followers? Praise Father for that. And yet we also know that God says in this time, in this place, he is also near and he's with you and with many of you, he's blessing you and he's moving you. And with others, he's convicting you to maybe bring your life to certain levels of repentance. And for others, he's calling you to himself. So understand that God is near. So what do we wait? What do we do while we wait? Look at this, verse four. This is what we do while we wait. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, people, this is just not positive thinking. This isn't just like, oh, yeah, things are hard right now. Oh, happy, happy, happy. Those people drive me nuts, right? Oh, trust me. No, this is not the point. Matter of fact, I was watching on the news the other day. Oprah Winfrey had her spiritual leader give people um, some calming advice in terms of how to get along with this epidemic and it was just very weird meditation, very strange. As a matter of fact, it just was coming across as a, a bit of denial of the reality of sin that this curse brings us. It clearly was that, that man is good. But what is us? How do we then rejoice? Well, we don't rejoice in denial, do we? We know we live in a sin-stained world. So don't rejoice believing that that isn't true. Our rejoicing is in the Lord. Notice the text. How? Only. Notice the word says, in the Lord. That's where we take our rejoicing. Our rejoicing is in our anticipation of his coming, where he will restore all things. And our rejoicing is, God, thank you for being present with me. But mostly our rejoicing is that you and I have received the gospel. And so we get the full blessing of the Holy Spirit talking to us, moving with us. And this is a supernatural rejoice in the Lord always. This is like none other. You can't rejoice with, like this without Jesus. And that's the beauty of this. And so people, we can rejoice along with other people that we are safe and we can do that. And that our families are well. We will praise God. And those are good things. And we can rejoice in those things. And, and even if you get a new job, you can rejoice in those things. But what if you lose your job? Do you rejoice? You don't rejoice in the suffering. But you can rejoice in God as you go through it. Because he's there. You don't rejoice in your anguish. And the suffering of people, you don't sit there and celebrate that. No, but you rejoice. Why? Because I can go through it because I have Jesus. That's what this rejoicing is. That's why I love Psalm 42 when he says, why my soul, why are you downcast? Is that rejoicing? It actually still is. Why so disturbed within me? Here's the rejoicing. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Now that is supernatural rejoicing. You see, this isn't flippant. And so this rejoicing is not only a section of praise, but it is also a, pray, a rejoicing that is in action. Notice, let your gentleness be evident to all men. And I love this passage when Jesus gives us a little bit of a better understanding of this gentleness or reasonableness. The other translations say uh, here in understanding this, he says in Matthew 5, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father who is in heaven. Think about it. Unbelievers can glorify your Father in heaven. This uh, last week, one of my friends brought over to my house crates of fruit and vegetables, just crates of them. And when he dropped them off, I went over to my neighbors and I had them all come over and they hoarded it. Not really, they just took a bunch of it. And I thought this was great. But here's the question. My, my neighbors are not followers of Jesus. They're great people though. But I will tell you, did they walk away saying, oh, thank you, Jesus? No, they didn't. But the Bible tells us they still glorify your Father who is in heaven. This is when you make your evidence 
to all men in action by your rejoicing with people, he is saying they will actually glorify your father. This is a supernatural rejoicing. It's amazing how God does this, right? So the second point is not only rejoicing because the Lord is at hand, but also pray because the Lord is at hand. I love this. In verse six, he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Okay, now this is a very touchy situation and I get it because here's the big question. Why doesn't God want us to be anxious? Now, I want to share this with you and be very transparent with you. I really personally struggle with anxiety um, and worry. I'm pretty good at it. I've got the gift. If you come up and you share your concerns with me, depending on certain levels of relationship, I get all that. I am very good at not only praying for you, but I can also be anxious for you. It is a weird place to be. Um, wanting to worry and be anxious of some things and thinking, I hope this doesn't happen. And if it does, what is going to go? It just drives me nuts, sometimes lose sleep. And I kind of think there's a lot of us that struggle with that. It isn't like when you have it, you say to yourself, wow, this makes me feel so good. It doesn't at all. As a matter of fact, it's, it's hard, isn't it? It's super challenging. I, I literally can't stand it some days. But I want to say that the definition of anxiousness is, is what we know it to be. It's experiencing worry, nervousness sometimes, right? Um, believing that we can actually control the situation. And when we can't know the complete outcome, anxiety happens. Those are hard for us. So being anxious is that need to be in control. That's really at the heart of it. And it's actually wanting to know the outcome. And when we don't know the outcome, then we go into worry. And it is a challenge. And yet the question is, why in the world does God not want us to be anxious? Well, I think it's also very obvious, right? So can you see why God commands us not to be anxious? He doesn't encourage us not to be. He doesn't say, hey, listen, you know, kind of hope it goes away. No, he says, don't be. I didn't write this. The Bible did. And I think here's why. If you look at 1 Peter 5, 7, he says, cast all your cares or anxiety on him. And here's why. Because he cares for you to get out of it. You see, church, anxiety is around us. And he's saying, rejoice in the Lord always. It's a different kind of rejoice. And people, do you think God is actually surprised by our anxiousness? He cares. He's not a God who's far and comes in and out. No, he's here and he desires to help get us out of that anxiety. He doesn't want us to stay there. He wants us out of it. And he realizes that being in anxiousness will take away my rejoicing in the Lord and people it does. So do you think God is surprised by our situation? You see, our anxiety believes God is surprised by it. And God, what are you doing in this? But he's not surprised by it, is he? Do you think that the father actually said to the son, oh my goodness, look what is happening on planet Earth. Oh, what are we going to do about it? I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. I guess we're just going to have to wait this out. We love them so much. Nope. I've heard of certain theologians who, matter of fact, one of them wrote a book called The Lies We Are Told About God. And in it, there's such a small view of God and that the focus was on the love of God and we don't want God to be in any way attributed to any of the problems and sins that take place. No, not at all. Therefore, he cannot control it, but he can sure love you and be concerned in the situation. And I hope it turns out okay. That is not the Bible because you see the way to handle anxiety is to understand that God is sovereign. And sovereign means that he rules everything. He's under control. He's not a fatalistic God. He's a loving God. He's a caring God. But he's a God that is in control. That should help our prayers and our anxiety. In Proverbs 19, he says, Many are the plans in the minds of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Lamentations 3. Who has spoken and it comes to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? 
Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad comes? Does it not come from him, the good and the bad? In other words, everything that happens is always within his plan. Nothing happens outside of God's plan. And that should bring comfort to us. You see, the world leaders... And many of the greatest scientists are trying to control this virus, aren't they? And my guess is they're saying, where's God? And if I were them, they should be trying to get an answer for that question. Um, Because I believe they are anxious and people, they should be. And so should the world, actually. Um, They have no idea. Everything is unknown. There's so much guessing going on. And every day the updates change. And I just shared some of that today. And I remember Greg Cahalan a couple of weeks ago sharing with us about worry. And he said that nowhere in the Bible are we ever told for unbelievers to not worry. We're told believers not to worry, believers not to be anxious, but nowhere. And I believe that is true with anxiousness. Nowhere in the Bible does it say to the world, don't be anxious. Actually, you should be. And the reason is, is they don't see God. They don't see God. And they don't see God in his control. But you and I, we see God is in control. He's got this, man. Jesus has got this. And so let's trust in his sovereignty. I want you to see this little video clip. I think it will show you the difference of this little girl who has a sense of God's in control and her mom in a bit of anxiousness. Look at this. Hey mama, you know when um the people at the church, not the church, but at the hospital were saying, I bet you that, that Jesus, like his heart was bursting. Oh, I'm sure. And the devil has no control anymore. You no are control. Me, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. The devil has no idea what Jesus is doing. Oh, I pray that God has this all like planned out and he knows exactly what he's doing. He does. Wasn't that a powerful video? That was a powerful video, wasn't it? Here's this little sweet daughter who's knowing for sure what's going on. I know that my kids and my grandkids know exactly what is going on. But I want them to trust in the sovereignty and that God is near. I want them to know and trust him. And church, let's do that together with our families. Because you see, anxiousness will doubt God and notice that mom was doubting God. So when is God near? Well, here's when God is near is when we battle anxiousness in prayer. That's when God is near. And Alan talked about that last week. By prayer and petition, stand firm in prayer. You see, the Roman soldiers in this word being used in verse one on standing firm, they actually had spikes in their shoes so that they could stand firm. And if you've ever played uh, football without plates, you'll know you slide all over the place. There's no footing. And what Paul is saying to this church is stand firm, put the spikes in the boots. And here's where you put the spikes in the boots is you stand firm and you pray. You pray that will battle your anxiousness. And also not only will that battle your anxiousness, but you need to have thanksgiving. We battle anxiousness with thanksgiving. Wear those shoes. It's firm. 
So instead of crying out to God with dissatisfaction and discontent or blaming him, look at the situation and say, God, thank you. Not thank you for the curse and the sin and the suffering and people dying and people losing their families. Please do not get me wrong at that. But thanking God for his faithfulness to you, that you can trust him and that he's near you and you can rejoice in the Lord. And when we pray with thanksgiving, our anxiousness will always lessen, you see. And also with gratitude. We battle anxiousness with requests. Look at this. He says, present, present your requests to God. I love this passage in John 14 when he says, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father will be glorified. Interesting verse, right? He's calling us to bring our requests to him. Bring everything in prayer. And then when we do that, we resist anxiousness. You know, let me tell you how I can go to anxiousness. As I talk to myself, sometimes my wife will walk into the room and she'll say, honey, you're talking to yourself. Oh, that's so embarrassing. The beautiful thing about driving in your car and you are talking, people think that maybe you're talking on your phone. So nobody knows you're actually talking to yourself. And when you talk to yourself, I win every argument. I've won every, I, I'm 100% on all of that stuff. But you know what I'm doing is I'm really praying to myself. I'm trusting myself. That's what I'm doing. Instead of bringing the request to God, I talk to myself. You see, that's what God is calling us to. And so we see that prayer is necessary. Thanksgiving is necessary and the request is necessary. But thirdly, have peace because the Lord is at hand. Peace because the Lord is near. I want you to look at verse seven here. He says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. Look at that. So what is God's peace here? Look at this peace, he says. It transcends all understanding. Look at the text. What is Paul saying? He's saying that this is one big, very big mystery. It's a supernatural peace within the Godhead and it transcends an understanding. This is a piece of assurance that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are at peace within themselves and that there's no disunity. We don't have to worry about them getting along, do we? They are different in roles, but they're one in essence, and they never will experience war within themselves or jealousy within themselves or factions. No, there's this unbelievable infinite love, isn't there? And so why does this transcend our understanding? Think about this. The point is, and the reason why Paul said it transcends our understanding is because God is infinite and you and I are finite. And that is, this is the point, is that you and I do not have the ability to fully and nor will we ever understand God unless he reveals himself. And so in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Here's what the Apostle Paul is saying is that there is peace within God. See, people, creatures can't understand that, can they? We haven't ever studied the truth of peace within God. We've studied the love of God, the goodness of God, but what does it mean to know that there is this peace within God that transcends understanding and there will be a day when we understand it? But why in the world does our nature not have peace? Why don't we have it naturally? And it's called a sin nature, isn't it? It's when we wrestle with the peace of God. And it's because sin and our transgressions against God, we lost it. And when we lost it become, because of sin, we went from normal to abnormal. Before sin came into the world, God's peace was with man. But man, because of sin, stepped out of this peace with God and all humanity became anxious, didn't they? And how do they get anxious? Well, there are songs written about peace, but it isn't God's peace. There are demonstrations that say, let's be about peace, but they don't understand God's peace. 
And there are world leaders who want to have peace talks. See, everybody on this planet yearns to be normal in peace. But this is why the whole world groans. It wants peace. It wants to be rejoicing, and he wants to be rejoicing in a restored manner. And consequently, peace is outside of God. Therefore, it's distorted. So where does peace really begin? It starts with God, not man. Rejoicing starts with God, not man. This is why you and I have the gospel. This is why we have Jesus, so that man can have peace with God. And guys, this is why we will have the resurrection celebration next week is because God sent his son so that we might have peace with him. But notice again in verse seven, when he says, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What does he mean here? Well, in John 14, he says, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid or anxious, please, because I'm giving you a supernatural peace. And where and how am I going to do this? Look at verse 7. In Christ, I will give you this peace. In Christ alone is the only way you and I will have this peace. This is what the Bible tells us. When I think of my friend Jay McKinney, some of you know him, some of you do not. He's a dear friend and he's struggling with cancer. And on his Facebook, he keeps a lot of us up to date in terms of what his family's going through. He's pretty funny, actually. I enjoy him. He has an amazing spirit, and I adore him. But we don't rejoice over the curse and the pain. And we don't find peace in that. But we do have peace in the fact that we know God. And when I listen to Jay, I see that he has a supernatural peace. And when I listen to my friend, he has a supernatural rejoicing. And is it scary? Yeah. But it does surpass all understanding. Which is why Paul says in verse 7, seven Stand firm and guard your heart and your mind. Please don't doubt God. Anxiety doubts. So Paul gives us a list, a list of ways that we can rejoice in these uncertainties, doesn't he? Look at these verses from verses 8 through 9. I'll read those to you. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Notice he says, brothers and sisters, Paul gives us a list in which he wants to help us learn how to rejoice in the Lord always and to put away anxiety. And it is these next few verses, eight and nine, that reveal how we can do that. He gives us a list. And he gives us a list that is a list that is to be helpful because it is a list that helps us understand on things that we are to think of, to fix our mind on, to think of these things. And here's what we are to think most of. Not just the fleeing from sin, not just don't look over there, not just getting out of tough situations and think of these things, how to get out of them. Those are fair and good. But he's saying, here are the things you're to think of. You're to think of Jesus. And how do I do that? Well, he says, whatever is true about Jesus. Notice John 14, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. This is true. Think of this. Whatever is noble, look at Matthew 20, verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve 
and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is noble. Think on these things. See, and whatever is right. In Luke 22, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours. Wow, this is right. Not my will, God, when he was in the garden, but I'm going to the cross because it is your will. This is right. And that's what we say, God, what do you want me to do? This is right. And whatever is pure, in 1 Peter 2, 22, in him there was no deceit. Think on those things. In Jesus is no deceit, so there ought not be deceit on our tongue. And when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. In other words, think on these things. Do not take revenge. For vengeance is mine, Jesus tells us. Think on these things. And whatever is lovely. John 15, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Think on these things. Jesus is saying, live a sacrificial life for people. And whatever is admirable, Matthew 26, 53. Do you think that I cannot call my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? <laughs> As he's getting ready to go to the cross, what does he do to the leaders? I could actually, I, I could take all of you out, but instead he resists and he does the admirable thing. And whatever is excellent. Matthew 28, there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was that like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He's risen, just as he said. Whatever is excellent, it is victory. And that's what he speaks to. Think on these things. Whatever is excellent, it is Jesus' victory. That's what is excellent. Stand firm, church. And whatever is praiseworthy. Revelations 1. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. What is he saying? Think of Jesus. He is living in victory and he is worthy of my praise. Think on these things. So our main point today is this, people. Stay away from anxiety and worry and run to the trust and the peace and the glory of God during these days. And keep looking to Jesus because people, he is near Wait on the Lord and rejoice and pray and have peace always. Hey, by the way, I just wanted to mention something. 60 days of happiness, discover God's promise and relentless joy. Uh, this is by Randy Alcorn. I would encourage you to get this and to start reading it daily. I think this would be helpful in these days and pass them out to some friends. Let's pray. God, you are good. You're faithful. Thank you for our church. And I do pray, God, that you would continue to use believers around the world to make a difference and proclaim the gospel, this beautiful good news. In a world that is full of anxiety, may they come to Jesus and see that there is great joy in you. In Jesus' name, amen.